Greetings, I'm Yvonne Staff for Science for the Public and welcome to Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. Today's program is Spotlight on the Impact of the Wildlife Trade. And <clears throat> about to hear some amazing facts and figures. Our two guests are the authors of a June article on just this topic in the conversation. The first is Maria Ivanova, Associate Professor of Global Governance and Sustainability at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. She's also visiting scholar at the Center for Collective Intelligence at MIT. Our second guest is Candice Pamagetti, PhD students at global, in, go, excuse me, in global governance and human security, and also a research associate at the Center for Governance and Sustainability at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. We are very pleased to welcome Dr. Maria Ivanova and Candice Pamagetti. Welcome, folks. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. And I would like to start, I, I think since we have arranged this talk, that there have been like three or four articles on the wildlife trade just very recently. And uh, uh, your article has just astounding facts and figures though. And that's what we would like to hear about because I don't think that we're uh, acquainted with it in general. What is the wildlife trade? What does it encompass, please? Thank you. Thank you very much for having us, Yvonne, and for indeed raising the profile of this very, very important issue. Wildlife, wildlife trade, and we'll talk about wildlife crime today as well. Surprisingly, there is no definition of wildlife. There is no accepted global definition no universal definition. In the United States, when we say wildlife, we typically mean wild animals. Globally, it often refers as wild animals, both terrestrial and marine, as well as plants. However, we don't have a definition and defining wildlife is critical. It is very important because the trade in wildlife has increased and so has wildlife crime. For example, the End of Wildlife Crime Initiative, there is a recent initiative that started called the End, End Wildlife Crime Coalition. It estimates that the global impact, the global economic value of wildlife crime is between one and two trillion dollars a year. In order to be, re to be able to regulate this, we need a definition of what we mean by wildlife. And much of this wildlife crime is actually driven by trade, which takes different forms. And it shows up in a variety of places that Candace and I have written about, and we characterize them as food, fashion, and pharmacy. Right, so um, I'll talk a little bit about the forms that those can take. It can be both live animals and also what they term wildlife derivatives, which is the trade and wildlife parts. Um, so live animals might include anything from exotic pets, roadside zoos, or for scientific research. And one astounding thing is that the trade in exotic pets in the US is robust. Um, although it's hard to say exactly how many uh, because no government agency is tracking them. One example is tigers. In the US, we have an estimated 5,000 to 10,000 tigers in captivity, and that's more than the 3,900 that are estimated to be in the wild. Um, also, if we're talking about wildlife parts, some of the things we, as Maria mentioned, we have food, fashion, and pharmacy, which we like to talk about, or folk remedies. Um, and that also, uh, we have hunting trophies, and other uses of exotic, exotic animals for ornamental purposes, which could be car or home decor. Uh, I understand that these like folk medicines or other kinds of things, uses for medications, uh, things, uh, and also even various kinds of food, uh, uh, things that are rather exotic. Uh, what is the biggest of these? Is there, does that matter? Are they all about equal? What? 
there are so um, many, and I'm actually, one of the things I was going to talk about a little bit later um, is the pangolin. Yeah. Um, so that has recently really, that animal particularly, it's the most heavily illegally traded mammal in the world. Um, there are small scaly anteaters that are native to Asia and Africa, and they walk on their hind legs and they hold their arms in front of them like little T-Rex. Um, but all eight species are illegal to treat, um, but they're traditionally used um, for women particularly, uh, use them for lactation purposes. You also have things that are, you know, these kind of things that are passed down, these beliefs that are passed down that um, you have also like tiger bone is very expensive. I think it's like 100 up to $115 a pound. Um, and that's typically used to treat a variety of ailments. You also have rhino horn. I mean, like really I could go all day. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And then uh, another thing that keeps coming up I, and it's new, I think for many of us in the general unknowing public, the fashion industry alone, and one of these recent articles in the media showed this, and these are in well-known and very expensive merchants' shops. What are people thinking? They must know it's illegal, or isn't it? Well, not everything is illegal. Yeah. A lot of the trade is legal trade, and... Uh, what we are seeing is demand for products and people don't even know what is uh, what what they are wearing or oh. sometimes they want to have what is perceived as fashionable what is a exotic. a sign exactly fashionable exotic a sign of wealth a lot of this trade is driven by a so by a desire for better social status. And this is why in the article, Candace and I, in a sense, tried to bust the myth of the super consumer, the Asian super consumer, or yes. the gun-toting African poachers. Yes. That we are as implicated in yes. the consumption in the West. Right. as we portray Asians to be. So it is not just the super rich Asians, right? Right, right. It is us who are demanding a lot of those, um, those products. And Candace can tell you about her research in, uh, in Oklahoma and in, in the shops where they're selling elephant skin boots. So yes. yes, elephant skin is legal, Yvonne. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Ivory is not, right? The elephant tusks are illegal. Ivory <laughs> is illegal. However, okay. the elephant has many parts. And now in this country, we are importing the skins and we are making boots out of them. And Candace has done research on that. Ah, let's hear a little. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I guess for me, like one of the things that's frustrating and, and that I can't quite wrap my head around why this is the case but when we a lot of times when elephant or other animals rhinos there's so many different species that when we discuss them in policy circles or in academia we talk about them in terms of ivory or we we like really mm -hmm. focus on a part of the animal instead of considering the animal as a whole sentient being so um when i started to like look into you know where they're place places selling uh, endangered species in the U.S., I started to come across a lot of elephant skin boots, and I'm from um, Oklahoma, so uh, my dad's favorite, like, western wear store was selling them, and, like, every, there's, we identified so many retailers selling elephant skin, um, but a lot of exotic boots. There's also high fashion bags. You might see celebrities like Jay-Z who wear custom elephant skin sneakers, or we even found, like, um, a National Geographic article talked about how, how some sheiks will actually use elephant, elephant skin to decorate their Mercedes Benz. So you have a lot of the, these uh, different uses for elephant skin, but in general, uh, it's a high luxury item, no matter what uh, different market it is in. So um, it's definitely 
talking about the way culture interacts, like we can see in Asia, we they typically consume the ivory, and then in the U.S., we're typically consuming skins, and most of it is in the fashion industry that we okay. can see. But but in any case, it's very damaging. I'll come to that in just a minute. But just let me ask here very quickly. It seems like originally when people took say animals from the wild it was generally for food and it was needed and it was local but now it, there's this gigantic trade in all kinds of things uh, uh, from animals mainly parts that they're going to use in some kind of food and it is not necessary i think but is that the case is there an economic factor so you uh, told us about this luxury thing that's the fault of the consumer if you could just change that this other is like this economic thing where our poachers, do they have no choice but to get into this? Is this, say, food or parts necessary for some economic uh, uh, level? So we always have a choice. Humans always have a choice, Ivan. No mm -hmm. matter where you are and at what economic level, you have a choice. Yes, we are driven by systemic factors, often by systemic forces to make certain choices. And indeed, that's where a lot of the poaching comes from. When we looked deeper into this, mm -hmm. poaching is a result of poverty. Mm -hmm. And yes, mm -hmm. people will have options if their governments were to, to create opportunities Yes, that would be different economic opportunities. But you point on a, to, to a very important issue about uh, wildlife or, I mean, the wildlife broadly defined in terms of uh, animals and, and, uh, and plants foraging. This is how we, we have what we have used for, as food indeed. And that's why we, we focus as the, the food fashion and pharmacy. Yes. Um, and we, we have changed food patterns. We have changed our fashion desires yes. Yes. to actually use more exotic animals. And indeed, a lot of cultures will use animals' parts in, in pharmacy. Um, yeah. But that is this is in a sense what we're we're trying to say we have to think differently what yes. what can you change and so yes there are other economic opportunities and some countries are already doing it for example rwanda is a very good case in point rwanda has mountain gorillas and it has created this experience of gorilla tracking where you go to rwanda you pay quite a significant amount of money because there are only 96 permits per day that 96 people can go into that trek. And you pay, I think it's $1,500 per person to go and have that experience just for the license. But then Rwanda has taken a very significant regulated approach and says, 10% of, of the income from these permits goes to the local communities. Uh -huh. So they build schools, they build roads, they have economic opportunities. But then this, this guerrilla trekking opportunity is also creating jobs for various types of, of people. I and see. it is also encouraging to conserve the, the wildlife that you have. And the government is also, has also put aside a, a fund and it pays farmers in case the gorillas destroy their crops. I and see. so this creates the opportunity to, leave, to live peacefully with the wildlife in the park. Yes, this is really important information. I think we're not aware that there are, there are these alternatives that people will just think them out, nation by nation or community by community. Yes. Also, if I could just kind of build on what Maria said, um, also recently with the um, with China banning wildlife markets, um, there has been some, re they've recently offered to buy the wild animals, buy out farmers to grow plants instead of of harvesting well. Ah. 
wild animals. So that uh, is another example. And and in I just is like one of the important points that I think is critical in the past. Uh, the the solutions both in academia and um, globally, a lot of our focus has been on militarizing uh, our anti-poaching forces or on big tech solutions. But a lot of this um, that is so critical now is that we really need to support these local livelihoods because uh -huh. we do know that the consumption in our poaching in this case is linked to poverty. We really need to support local livelihoods and people transitioning out of wildlife related industries, they need to be supported with opportunities for decent work. And so with that, nationally and internationally, we need to be scaling up our uh, conservation measures instead of scaling back right now. Thank you, because that's all really very helpful. I'm impressed that uh, some governments are trying to address the situation by alternatives, not just by prohibitions, but by alternatives looking at the real problem. Does any of that have to do with a greater recognition of the impact on ecosystems by any chance? Do you all look into that, the impact on, like you remove some of these large animals on a large scale, it messes up an entire ecosystem. And I believe in your article, you even mentioned plants, trees or whatever too. Is, uh, does this mess up ecosystems? Yes. <laughs> the obvious answer to that is <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 <laughs> there. Can you explain it a little bit? Because I think, again, we don't get this kind of information in the public. We don't have a good sense of ecosystems and their fragility with this kind of stuff. That, that's right. Um, we, as humans, we do impact ecosystems and in turn, we are impacted ourselves. Yes. So we're living through this right now, Yvonne. Yeah, because big time. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> what is what is happening is that we have expanded our spaces into the ecosystems. Yes. We have pushed back wildlife. We have destroyed habitats. And we're going further and further into the natural habitats of wildlife. We have started extracting more and more wildlife for our own consumption fancies. And nature is pushing back mm -hmm. through zoonotic diseases that we are yes. living through. Um, we are at risk. But also this push on, on wildlife and uh, on, on nature has led to as the UN said in 2019, one million species are at risk yes. of extinction. Right. That could lead to the sixth extinction mm -hmm. event. And the more we impact ecosystems and we remove, whether it's plant or animal species from those ecosystems, as you said, we also exacerbate climate change and in turn, that leads to far more uh, deleterious conditions for us to, to live in. And so everything we do is, is a cause and effect relationship. Right. And uh, I think through this zoonotic disease crisis that we're living through currently at a global level, I mean, it has been months. We've been yes. at home for four yeah. months. We are, Candace and I are at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. It's an educational institution, the only public university in Boston. We don't know what's going to happen in the fall, right? Right. Now we cannot even welcome our international students. Uh, yes, another issue, right? <laughs> and yet this issue is connected to what? Absolutely, absolutely. Everything is connected. Yeah, we're and learning. Exactly, everything is connected and yet we don't have the policies that treat these issues as connected. We exactly. don't have the responses. And I would dare say, we don't even have the education that actually <laughs> treats these issues as connected. And this is what we have been 
actually working on. Yes. And the 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 doctoral program in which Candace is a is a candidate currently in global governance and human security treats these issues in a transdisciplinary way as interconnected uh, right. parts of a whole. That's what I'd like to go to next, but I do want to um, uh, make clear that, that you've brought out several things we are not aware. I can't believe it, but well, it's because this is an, a science organization, but people have been talking about the zoonotic threat for years and they still can't get the governments to pay attention and then you need the governments to pay attention in order to get the word out to the general public. Well, that's kind of your territory, This, this the, the issue of the need for who's going to manage that information and, and manage those policies. And I'm so impressed with the work that you folks have done on the need for international cooperation. It looks like you need international policy cooperation. Please tell us what it is you do and why that is so necessary. We do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let me let me look at this in, in a couple of ways. Um, both Candace and I are researchers, we're scholars, but we're also engaged in policy. And so what we do is we produce scholarship with policy impact. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, the work that you picked up on, right, we, we didn't know each other before you invited us for this interview and we're delighted to, to be connected with you. And this is just one example of the work that we are doing of picking up an issue, making it relevant in, in ways that the public can understand. And yes. as you pointed out, Yvonne, bringing out facts and figures that somehow escape us. And then we actually push for policymakers to act and to yes. react, yes. both nationally and internationally. And so the work that we do is one at the University of Massachusetts, the McCormick Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies, that's the academic work. And then the policy arm of that is the Center for Governance and Sustainability. I see. That I direct and established in 2011 at the university. And so PhD students like Candace and several others are both research associates at the center and mm -hmm. PhD uh, students. So mm -hmm. I personally work on global environmental governance, on the institutions that we have created to uh, regulate and uh, inspire action on problems that require collective action. And so I look at the United Nations, how it has functioned, how it has malfunctioned, dysfunctioned yes. <laughs> in a certain way, and what can be done about it. I study mm -hmm. the United Nations Environment Program, which is the anchor institution for the global environment. Mm -hmm. It was created in 1972 with uh, the first UN conference on the global environment, the Stockholm Conference, and it was as a result of that Earth Day foment that happened in the United States. And this is another thing we don't talk about, is that it was actually the United States that led to yes. the creation of Good the point. global institutions. Yes. Whether it's the United Nations in the 1940s after World War II, or yes. whether it is the United Nations Environment Program. And yet what we're seeing right now is the United States exiting the Paris exactly. Climate Agreement, the At World the Health time. Organization. Yeah. Right, right. And so our scholarship is about issues that are relevant, that are current, and we seek to influence the minds of people, but also the actions of governments. And Candace can tell you about her research, which is indeed on, on wildlife. And we have a lot more facts to share with you about wildlife. Yes. We're going to run out of time before you can share everything. I know. <laughs> get especially clear what it is you attempt to do in terms of this getting international policies uh, uh, sort of established and uh, why there is a need, if you think so, for like an international approach to these problems. 
if you can tell me that. So, um, um, one part of my research is on uh, wildlife trade and then the international policy aspect of that is the Convention mm -hmm. on International Trade and Endangered Species. So I work with uh, Maria and uh, on that, but um, as far as studies goes, it, it what with these inter international environmental conventions, as uh, parties come together, they cooperate and they agree on the roles and the laws and the regulations, right? So there's 183 parties to CITES that started in 1973. And so right now, all of the regulations through CITES are based on conservation status of the species. There's no public health incorporated into regulating the trade. So then what happens when that is implemented at a domestic level, for instance, in the, the US, our implementing agency, our, our management authority for studies is the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. And there are um, no screening requirements at all. Uh, for any of the legal trade or illegal trade in terms of public health risk of these species, which we know are very great. I, I think you had Jonathan, oh, I can't remember his last name. Yes, yeah, yes, was, Ron Stadler. Yes, yeah. thank you. And he was talking about 60% of the zoonotic diseases come from animals and three fourths of those we know originate in wildlife. So there has to be some kind of public health uh, incorporated we need to incorporate what is called, which Maria can talk about a little bit more, but it's a, a framework into studies needs to be added, which is one health where it takes into animal health, human health and ecosystem health all at the same time. And then also um, we have some staggering facts and figures uh, about the import of animals in both the, the legal trade and the illegal trade. Um, so just kind of to, to throw one out there, um, a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service inspector recently wrote in the National Geographic that in the U.S. alone, there are 200 million live animals, which is worth up to $4.3 billion uh, yes. just in 2019. So it's it's just something that we really need to, to have our eye on and to really make changes in these areas. Um, so, it, Maria, do you want to talk about some of the global initiatives kind of uh, the the uh, excuse me I'm go we're gonna we just have a sort of a few oh, minutes, so I wanted to make sure that we get this this global aspect right two things that how you try to accomplish that to get an international uh, impact there the second is how successful it is and uh, especially given that, as you have mentioned, we are heading into a sixth extinction here, and that will affect us. It's not just the creatures, it will affect all humanity as well. But I'd like to get a very clear idea of how you can get international efforts. Uh, the climate change is one of them, and then uh, attached to that, the what are the prospects of getting things actually done? Are, are you able to get international cooperation to work? And I will leave the United States out of that for the moment. But I hope that we'll be back in the uh, group again. Go ahead. Actually, Yvonne, the United States is absolutely critical to all yes. international efforts. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, it has been the United States that created the institutions, that has supported the institutions, that has led the institutions and, and the world toward a better global uh, vision, right? Toward a vision of a, of, a, um, of a global society where we achieve global public good. Right. And we, ha we owe this to a lot of... Uh, statesmen and stateswomen in uh, in this in this country that we we kind of we, we forget about um and uh to to attain a new global agreement on yes. on anything we do have to see what is the collective need what is the problem what are the why does that problem exist and often it is because 
countries have not come together to, to actually coordinate their action and to create a global instruments. Um, it usually originates in science. When science points to a global problem and then policy makers and policy scholars point to possible solutions, then the world comes together and governments agree to an international instrument. A case in point is the agreement on the de uh, ozone depleting substances. So the, most, the, the uh, Montreal Protocol. And that is the only global problem that we actually have resolved. So yes. science, policy options, policy instruments, and governments coming together. And I think we do have that with wildlife and the zone. Okay. That's, that's good. So are you saying you're reasonably optimistic? We can get global cooperation uh, in, to uh, address these kinds of problems. It just seems looking at the things that you've written and so forth, it's got to be global. In, in the, at the end of the day, it needs to be a global initiative. Is it doable? And how fast can it be done? <laughs> Um, it has to be a global initiative. And in a way, I say now that we are living through a local problem, yes. it demands global solution. Yes. yes. The current pandemic is a local problem. We are all experiencing it locally, but it has to have a global solution. Yes. And the whole trade issue, as you're... Yes say right is the only way to address that at the end is a global kind of effort and I hope you will keep writing Candace you were about to say something else yeah I just want to say one thing so like for instance it has to be global and this is just an example if wildlife trade one nation ends wildlife trade um say China um they're implementing solutions and they're banning yes. wildlife but if we're not doing it in the United States and we're still consuming, everyone's still at risk for a, a pandemic. It's not gonna, like, it has to be a complete across the board. We, or, I mean, there's gonna, we're still at risk. So right. it's, yeah. Right. And so at the end of the thing, the issue is it's, uh, it's health, it's, uh, it is economics, it's a whole lot of things that impacts yeah. the whole society. We're not aware in general that just this issue has such a broad effect on us, not just on the wildlife, it has an effect on the globe. And so I hope that you will continue your great work. And uh, by the way, I would like to mention to the viewing audience that the conversation of the online magazine is an excellent resource for a whole lot of topics. And I'm so delighted to see that Maria has written a lot of articles in that. But we post at least one article from the conversation every week. The, this is very good, very accessible material. And I appreciate your work. Do you have any parting thoughts? How can we educate ourselves? I would like to, to say what drove us also to, to write about this with, with Candace, be beyond the scholarly work that uh, she and I are, are doing. Yes. It is indeed that we have responsibility as individuals. And yes. as little as that seems in the face of global environmental problems, yes. in terms of wildlife, it, we have agency. And this is yeah. why we appeal for end of consumerism yes. and for conscious consumption. And so we would like to appeal to your viewers to think about what we are consuming, what we are putting in our bodies, what we are putting on our bodies yes. and what we are putting on our faces. Yes. Food, fashion, pharmacy are critical. Okay. And we have agency over that. So having the public consciousness, it worked to a large extent with environmental concerns, climate, it's getting there. It's just that you still need a policy at the end of the day, but I really yeah. appreciate the work that you're doing. Please keep it up. Please keep getting out there to the public because I think there's a lot of appreciation for what you're doing. It's that we don't see a lot of it in the media. 
in general, it seems like, you know, but uh, yeah. as I mentioned, I was surprised to see several articles all in a row about this wildlife issue now. And please keep doing your wonderful work. Thank, Thank you. you. Yvonne, before yes, so. we end, actually, Candace even has an idea of how to get to the public. Okay, get to the public, go. <laughs> All right, so um, we know that demand reduction campaigns are necessary. Yes. Um, and that was one of the reasons we wrote the articles because we do need to focus on target markets and getting this message out. And um, that way that we have some voice for the endangered species. And as I mentioned, I'm in Oklahoma and there's a very, very big demand for exotic animals there. And I like we need celebrities to get on board that have influence in these target markets. So as a fellow Oklahoman, I think Blake Shelton is a primary example of someone with influence in the Western wear market or uh, with retailers and also Gwen Stefani and street style and high fashion. But we really have to start getting celebrities involved, start campaigning and also encouraging individuals to put petition their local lawmakers and, and also just pushing regulation because we have to really start to get this out because not a lot of people know about it, as you mentioned. Yes, but the, then the other thing attached to that is that we in the public, as we do become informed, have an obligation to put pressure on legislators. Exactly. So we get rules and regulations, at least in the country and, and that sort of thing. Yes. So, uh, thank you ever so much. This thank was been very, very interesting. Please keep writing. Write letters to the <laughs> editor and do things like that. We really appreciate this. Again, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.